All right, all right, all right. We're back with Apothecary, which I was just going to attempt to read upside down for fun. And um, we are on chapter 19, which is called Invisible. Uh, what do you notice is my question for today. I am certain that at this point in the year, most people have learned a variety of comprehension strategies, okay? Um, they've learned literary devices, They've learned different ways of analyzing text. I could go on. One way that we analyze text is by using notice and note strategies. I know this is small for you, but you can look it up. You can um, check it out. I'm gonna share some with you right now that you can be looking for as I read chapter 19. So notice and note strategies hinge on the idea that you're gonna look for certain things and when you see them, you're gonna stop and ask yourself a question. So here we go, a contrast and contradiction. When a character does or says something that's opposite what you expect them to do, you should stop and ask yourself, why is the character acting this way, right? So when you see something opposite to your expectations, why is the character acting this way? Aha moment, when you're reading and suddenly a character realizes, understands, or finally figures something out, you need to ask, how might this change things? Again and again, when a reader comes up upon something, um, a word, a phrase, an object, or a situation mentioned over and over again, you should ask yourself, why does this keep showing up again and again? Um, words of the wiser. When you're reading and a character who's probably older and wiser takes the main character aside and gives serious advice, you should ask yourself, what's the life lesson? And how might it affect the character? So like the gardener was ideal for words of the wiser, okay? Memory moment. When you're reading and the author interrupts action to flashback to the past and tell you a memory, you should ask yourself, why might this memory be important? And finally, a tough question. When you're reading and the character asks himself or herself a really difficult question, you should stop and ask yourself, why does this question, make, what does this question make me wonder about? So there are a variety of ways to help you engage more thoroughly with the text. Today, I'd like you to try and pick one to focus on. Um, I've gone over these a bunch, so hopefully you're familiar with them. And this little, the icons here will just help you to remember. Oh yeah, aha moment. Mr. Gillum's chemistry classroom was locked. But it only took Pip a few seconds to open the door with a bent paper clip. The room was empty, and Benjamin relocked the door and lodged a chair under the knob. I remembered that the invisibility spell the gardener had shown us in the pharmacopoeia was on the page just after the smell of truth, and that the Greek letters A-I-D-O-S at the top. I remembered because invisibility appealed to me much more even than flying. We found the page and the instructions were in Latin. So Benjamin started translating with Sergi's primer. Balinium means bath, he said. I think we have to prepare a bath. A bath, Pip said. Don't you just drink elixir? Maybe you have to soak in this one to be invisible, I said. We considered the classroom sink, which wasn't deep enough. What about that, Pip asked, pointing to a big garbage can in the corner. We emptied the crumper paper out and carried the can over near the book. It was large enough to get inside and it wasn't even too disgusting. Ew, I beg to differ. Now what, Pip asked. Liquefied aurum. Benjamin flipped the primer pages. Liquefied means melt. We have to melt something. We need a Bunsen burner. Here, take the dictionary, Janie, and I'll set one up. What's RM? I looked it up. Gold, I said, my heart sinking. We don't have that. If we were decent alchemists, we could make it, Benjamin said. We need two drachma. Benjamin looked at the ceiling, calculating. He'd retained at least some knowledge of compounding medicines from working for his father. That's about a quarter of an ounce, I think. Not much. I just want to point out how quickly these children are now learning Latin because it's necessary. Hmm. Janie's gold, got gold earrings, Pip said. I reached for my ears and felt the small, round studs. They were my grandmother's, I said. She's dead. There was a silence in the room. 
My nan, Helen, was my mother's mother, and she tried to act elegant and sophisticated when she came to visit us because that's how she thought Hollywood was. But she couldn't help being warm and silly because that was her nature. The earrings were the only thing of, things of hers I had. Benjamin looked uncomfortable. You don't have to give them up, he said. Yes, I do, I said, and I took the, off the earrings. Here, melt them. Are you sure? Yes, and I almost was sure now that I made the offer. She'd want us to find your father. Thank you, Benjamin said, holding them for a second in indecision before he dropped them in a clay crucible over the Bunsen burner. I looked away. It's a big, big moment there. There were other ingredients and I helped translate the rest of the instructions, but I can't tell you what they were because I was thinking about how my Nana Helen had made me promise to wait to pierce my ears until I was 20. I had promised, but only because I thought I'd, she'd live to see me grown up. Well, past 20. She died when I was 12. And it seemed unfair. At a slumber party that same year, I let Penny Meadows numb my earlobes with ice and then pierce it with a needle and dental floss, using half a potato as a backstop. I almost fainted, but not from the piercing, which didn't hurt as much as the ice did, but from the feeling of the floss being pulled, dragging slightly through my ear. Ugh. I let Penny do the other one too, because I was going to be elegant like my nan, Hella had always wanted to be. My mother was upset, but she came around. A sewing needle, she said, inspecting the neat holes. And you didn't faint? You take after your father. Benjamin ground the metal, melted gold with something else until it became a powder, which he mixed into a solution that he poured into the garbage can and diluted with water from Mr. Gillen's chemistry lab sink. Now what, I asked. Lava ester deposits, Benjamin read. That's the last thing on the page. I flipped through the primer. Oh no, I said. What does it mean, Pip asked. It's a command to wash. Um, the clothes have been dropped, I said. I think it means get in the bath naked. We all looked at one another. The bird thing worked on clothes, Benjamin said in a tone of protest, as if being naked was my idea. The gardener said there are different ways of changing something, I said. I think he called the avian elixir a transformative process and said that this one is only a masking process. Maybe it only works on your body. So, if it wears off, we'll be starkers inside a military bunker, Pip said. <laughs> he doesn't miss much, Pip. We might feel it wearing off, Benjamin said, and have some time. What, three seconds, Pip asked? Time to put your hands over your willy? Benjamin shook his head, dismissing the objections. I have to find my father, he said. You don't have to do this, but I do. He shrugged off his school blazer and started untying his tie. We'll go with you, I said. Maybe you should turn around, Janie. Wait, Pip said. Mr. Gillen had a freestanding blackboard in the room. The two-sided kind that moves on wheels, and Pip rolled it between the garbage can and us. We've got a screen like this at home, he said, because the bath's in the kitchen. Benjamin stepped behind the rolled blackboard, and we could only see him from the knees down. So again, remember the previous chapter I asked you, who is Pip? We just got another little hint about his life. And, um, and that's in contrast to my life in a contradiction. I don't have a bathtub in my kitchen. What must his apartment look like? Okay. Um, just be thinking about those things. Benjamin stepped behind the rolling blackboard and we could only see him from the knees down. His white shirt dropped to the floor and he kicked off his shoes and pulled off his socks. His feet were pale and looked vulnerable. His blue wool pants dropped and he climbed into the garbage can with a slosh. Benjamin, I said, remembering, the note in the margin said, leave one part of your body out. What part? I've got a funny idea, Pip said. That's not funny. Benjamin said, and it's too late anyway. I blushed in spite of myself. Pip giggled. Maybe part of a hand, I said. Something you can see so you'll know when other people are seeing it. My hand's already wet. A shoulder, Pip suggested. I'll try, Benjamin said. It's awkward in here. 
There was more sloshing and we heard the thud of a knee or an elbow against the side of the metal trash can. Then a wet footprint appeared on the concrete bes floor beside Benjamin's clothes and another. There were no feet making the footprints. Benjamin, I said, it works. We, can see we can't see your feet. There was silence from behind the blackboard except for the dripping. Benjamin, I said, it's so strange, he said, I can't see myself. Come out and show us, Pip said, but I'm naked. But we can't see you. The wet footprints kept slowly around the side of the blackboard. A pale smudge of pink skin floated five feet above the ground. I knew it must be part of Benjamin's shoulder, but I wouldn't have noticed it if I hadn't been looking for it. The pink spot moved and a wet handprint appeared in the white chalk dust on the blackboard. There was no other sign of him. It's as if I'm not here, he said, wondering. Brilliant, Pip said. I'm going in. He disappeared behind the board. I can't tell you how strange this feels, Benjamin's voice said from just above the pink floating spot of, of sink. The two of us stood there awkwardly. I was as awed by the fact that he was naked as that he was invisible. There was a slosh as Pip climbed into the can. Remember to leave some part of your body out, I said. Right, Pip said. I don't know if I can do this, I said. It might be too embarrassing. You think it isn't embarrassing for me? Benjamin asked. There was another sloshing behind the chalkboard and Pip's wet footprints came scampering around the side. He was laughing delightedly. I love this, he said. I always wanted this. At first I couldn't see what was, what was visible on him, but then I saw one floating ear. It was more identifiable as a body part than Benjamin's shoulder was, but it was also smaller and harder to see, especially when he was facing us and we weren't seeing the ear from the side. I want to go everywhere, Pip said. We can sneak into the cinema, ah, the casino, and the races. First, we can go to the bunker and find my father, Benjamin reminded him. Your turn, Janie. I went around the blackboard and looked at the two piles of clothes on the floor. Experimentally, I dunked a corner of my sleeve into the bath. It came out soaking wet, but unchanged. If I kept my clothes on, I'd be invisible, but, it, but in wet, visible clothes. I love that Janie is the one who always kind of pauses and thinks, I should test this first. Come on, Janie, Benjamin's voice said, before Mr. Gillum comes back. We can't see you. I looked once more into the garbage can full of solution and thought that if my grandmother's earrings had been melted down for this, I might as well make use of it. I took off my clothes and climbed in. I decided to keep the pinky finger of my right hand out as it seemed small and easy to hide. The water was cold and I held my breath and tucked my knees so I could be dunk my head under the and get my hair wet. I waited a few seconds, then stood up, dripping, and looked down at myself. There was nothing there. It was disorienting. When I touched my arm, it felt slippery and wet, but I couldn't see it. I only saw water dripping in the shape of an arm. The clash between what I knew and what I saw made me dizzy. I climbed out, watching the water fill in the space in the can where my body had been, and saw the telltale footprints appear on the classroom floor. Did it work? Pip asked and his ear came around the screen. Hey, I said, you're not supposed to come back here, but you're invisible. Benjamin's clothes seemed to be picking themselves up off the floor and I could see his pink shoulder leaning over. I didn't barge in on you guys. We don't know how long it will last, Benjamin's voice said. We have to go. A low cupboard below the sink opened and his clothes seemed to just throw themselves into it. We should dump the bath. I wish we could keep it for later, Pip said wistfully. We can't leave a trail, Benjamin said. I put my clothes in the cupboard, wanting to make them, take them with me, although they would have looked like a bundle of clothes floating bizarrely down the street. The heavy garbage can seemed to levitate as Pip and Benjamin lifted it together and poured it out in the laboratory sink. Then we heard a thump from across the room, the thwarted noise of wood jamming as someone shoved the classroom door against the propped chair. Who's in there? Mr. Gillen's voice called. Benjamin and Pip threw the paper trash back into the wet garbage can. I put away the Bunsen burner and the crucible and the beakers we'd used. Then I saw the pharmacopoeia on the table. The book, I said. We couldn't carry it out without it being seen. 
The teacher rattled the doorknob again. Open this door! The book seemed to float in Benjamin's hands to a high shelf with some other heavy chemistry books. I saw the logic. It looked like it belonged there and blended in. Mr. Gillum was pounding on the door by now. We moved cautiously towards it. I'll move the chair, I whispered. You go out after he comes in. We got in position and I reached for the chair. It was like reaching for something in the dark, knowing approximately where it is, but it was the opposite. I knew exactly where the chair was. It was my own hands I couldn't see. The pinky finger, at least, was reassuring. When I had a good grip, I pulled the chair free. Mr. Gillum, who was so perfectly round that his belt looked like it bisected a beach ball, burst into the room and stood looking around. I saw Pip's ear, then Benjamin's shoulder glide out of the room. I stayed very still. I know you're in here, Mr. Gillum said. I dodged him as he came near. He stormed past me, looking for the rascally student who were surely crouching behind the lab tables, and I slipped out. The school was empty, even the chess club was gone, and we ran down the hall in bare feet. It was disoriented, running without being able to see my legs. It almost made me forget about being naked, but not quite. The secretary with the sheep's curls came out of her office and we slowed down so we'd make no noise. I slid, by, I slid my visible pinky along the wall, but she didn't seem to notice anything. I could see that Pip had kept his paperclip for picking locks, but no one expects to see a finger or a paperclip floating down the hall, so no one does. We pushed open the front door of the school and stepped out into the February day, and it was freezing. Being damp and naked, I hugged my arms. I'd anticipated the embarrassment of nakedness, but I'd completely forgotten about the cold. Pip let loose a shocking string of words, most of which I'd never heard before. Is there some trick that makes you warm, he asked. I only know one, Benjamin said. Well, running to Bethnal Green. Benjamin said. The patch of pink shoulder set off down the steps as fa at a fast clip, and Pip and I followed. I tried to think about how we were rescuing Benjamin's father from evil forces, and that was what mattered. Not that the cold concrete stung my feet, and not that we were running naked and freezing into the wind. There's a thought to leave you with. I'll t tell you more in chapter 20. I hope you took the time to find a few different um, notice and note strategies as I read. Um, I think there might have been, you know, one or two. Um, I think Janie did a good job of describing her grandmother and the moment with her earring, which gave you an insight to her character trait. I think we call that, oh, I don't know, a memory moment. Um, and why might that memory be important? Kind of answered that question for you. But there are a ton of different thoughts there, and um, I look forward to sharing more later. Bye.